Hi, I'm Paul Cargan, and I'm here with Patricia Roberts-Miller, uh, professor of rhetoric at University of Texas, Austin, and author of several books, including uh, the one we're going to talk about today, Demagoguery and Democracy. Uh, Trish, thanks for talking with me. No, thanks for having me. This is fun. I, I really love books, um, and I especially love really small books, because then you can read more of them, and you can read more carefully. Um, so I, so I especially loved your book for being small and would recommend it to people who like small books. But part of it being short is you're writing for a broader audience than academics usually do. Uh, can you tell me about that? That was, it was really hard. I mean, it, uh, it was something I'd always wanted to do. Um, I have long wanted to write a really short book. I'd often imagined writing a short uh, argument textbook and um, because I think that um, they give teachers more freedom, for one thing, it, you know, oh. and because um, if you buy a big book and you feel obligated to use it, and and um, but you know you can do a bunch of little books in a class. So that's that's one thing, but also I felt like I'd I'd hit a point where I'd done um, you know a bunch of academic books and they have their value and I'm proud of them but I wanted to do something else. I, I just wanted to reach a broader audience. And, um, and it's hard, you know, it's, it's a really different kind of writing. It's, um, I, I told people I felt like I was writing with my left hand because I knew what I, w I knew what I thought, but, but that, that way of writing is just really different. Um, I want to get a handle on the two terms of your title uh, a bit. So I think, I think democracy is a term we use a lot more or, or, or people who aren't rhetoricians than demagoguery. Uh, demagoguery. So, so after I'm reading your book, this is, this is how I'm kind of trying to get a handle on the term. Um, it's, it's like a specific form of binary thinking or dualism where, where issues or questions that, that, ought, that are complex and ought to be decided on the basis of reasoning and and deliberation instead get decided on the basis of whose team are you on right basically yeah that we should be arguing policy and instead of arguing policy we argue um uh it, we i'm not even sure we argue as much as we just assert or perform i'm on this team and you're not so so for instance we have uh just right now uh, in the news uh, a lot is this caravan of refugees from central america and if we were if we were going to take a demagogic approach to that then we wouldn't ask you know why are they coming and and what can we do to help them and are there are there things we can do to address the root causes and what are what are the ramifications of helping them? none of those questions would come in it's just what side am I? Am I anti-immigrant or pro-immigrant? Right. Right, and and that would be determined by um, whether you see yourself as loyal or disloyal to Republicans or Democrats or you know um, some other group along those lines. And you know the thing about arguing policy is that you would just be arguing about you know is there real harm from them? If so, what is that harm? Um, what are the plans that we have for resolving whatever harm it is that we associate, see associated with them? What makes that whole discourse so demagogic, I think, is that um, immediately the the uh, term illegal is associated with them. And but what they're doing is legal. It's it's perfectly legal to ask for refuge in the United States on political grounds. Um, what happens, you know, if you get denied that? That's when you can start getting into things. But they haven't broken a law yet. And they have indicated no intention of breaking a law. So the fact that we've instantly associated, you know, thrown them in this category of people who are trying to break the law, that's one of the signs that it's a very, it's just demagogic. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the other term of your title about that maybe it's important to make a case for democracy. I, I um, seems more and more that people don't automatically agree that democracy is a good thing or a goal. Um, even after we, we spent some very expensive wars ostensibly spreading democracy, uh, now when, when things come up that maybe question the principle of one person, one vote, um, a lot of people will say, well, we're not a democracy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what's, you know, what's, what's good about democracy? Um, 
and also, you know, I, I, I tend to follow the political um, scientists like David Held who, who make republicanism a kind of democracy. So the whole like we're not a democracy because we're a republic does not, that's not useful. Um, but um, there are, you know, there are lots of different kinds of democracies and um, democracies that rely on representation is it's still democracy. But um, I think that when people, you know, a tremendous number of Americans do support authoritarianism and um, they often support authoritarianism because on the grounds of it supposedly being faster and more efficient. So I found it really interesting, um, the books, uh, Stealth Democracy and Democracy for Realists, really interesting but of the statistics they have of the number of, of Americans who think that there are simple solutions to problems that politicians are deliberately ignoring. And so they want to put someone into place who will, you know, take, who will just do those obvious things. And um, so, and I, I think that you can hear a lot of authoritarian discourse in virtually any community that you're in. Um, it, it showed up all the time on the neighborhood mailing list. I hear faculty do it, you know, that there's obviously something that the university should be doing and it's not doing it, so they must be ill-willed. Um, so it's it's something I think that you have to see as just a fact of the human condition that there is there is disagreement that the right course of action is not always obvious, um, and what looks like a right course of action from your perspective may not be the right course of action from another perspective, and that's why you have democracy, is because you can get all those different perspectives involved. You you stress in the book um, throughout that demagoguery is something we all can do, um, mm -hmm. that we all can fall prey to it. Um, but, but it's also possible that not everyone is doing it to the same degree. And so I found, I found myself reading the book, ironically, I think, thinking, oh yeah, this really describes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, oh, oops. I yeah. to them. <laughs> But is there, I mean, there's, there's, is there a way to cr critique demagoguery? It's a hard word to say, I know. <laughs> falling it, into it yourself? Yeah, because keep in mind that, that you know, what I'm saying is that it's, um, so, demo, so democratic discourse can be mean, it can be hostile, it can be angry, um, it can be, um, you know, all sorts of things, and it can be vehement. And so a lot of times people think that, as if you vehemently criticize someone, that's demagoguery. Not necessarily, right? Um, if you vehemently criticize somebody's argument, uh, that's probably not demagoguery, um, unless you critique it on the grounds that they're making that argument shows they're a member of a group and that group is evil. But yeah. if you know, if you're saying no, that logic doesn't work. This you've got this. Um, uh, assumption that you're making here that's bad. Here are the consequences of your of your policy. Um, that's you know that that can happen. I mean that's that's important and that's what we should be doing. But it, I'm not one of those people advocating that people be nicer to each other because I think if we're going to argue policy, we're going to get mad. That's just how it you know how it works, and um, and that's okay. The fact that we're mad means we care. So um, I think yeah. So I, and and I think also demagoguery can be fun, which is one of its attractions in that you you can have this moment of feeling like my group is totally right and that group is totally wrong. Um, and we're, if it's something rare, it'd be fine. But the fact that it's everywhere is the problem. In, um, I think I think you give sports teams as an example. Yeah. yeah. Of kind of, and I think a lot of people who have like their team view it as this kind of fun like there's a part of them that knows their team isn't the best in the world. Right. Yeah. Losing. Yeah. But is, is that harmless fun or is that training us just through practice to, to approach things that way? Um, I, yeah, I used to say that I wish that people argued about politics the way they argued about sports teams because you could get really subtle analysis in sports teams. Um, uh, you know, arguments about sports teams. I feel like now it's shifted a little bit to where people really are like, they want a coach who wins. Um, and uh, it's, I, I feel like even the discourse over sports has gotten um, more partisan and, and weird in that way. But um, yeah, I think that that's, I think that's a, that question is one I, I really haven't decided. So once you're in a culture of demagoguery, um, 
then the fact that it is everywhere, does that mean that that sort of apparently harmless demagoguery about, um, you know, the Bee Gees or um, Nickelback fans or, or, you know, Aggies is, is harmless? Because yeah, it's, is it just training us to do more of the same? So I think it, it depends on how common it is, you know? Um, but if that were the only kind of demagoguery we engaged in, that'd be fine. There'd be mm. no problem. Um, you, you, you spell out a number of the consequences of demagoguery early, early in the book. And one of them on page 12 is that. Let me get my copy. <laughs> it's that the fourth, fourth point in your list there is that losing a political argument now has much higher stakes. It isn't just about whether you persuaded someone of the merits of your policy. Uh, but about whether you are a good person. And that, to me, that, that sounds like such a dangerous place to be in, not just for the other people who never have a chance to persuade you, but for you. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could end up being stuck in some positions that you wouldn't take if you could step back and lower the stakes and think about it. I think, that, yeah, I think that's absolutely true, right. And that's... Um some people like Elliot Aronson um, talks about, I think he calls it the triangle of harm. So how you can, you can do real harm because you do a little bit, you do something a little bit harmful and, but you don't want to admit that you did. And so then you end up kind of having to do it. You, you now can't step away from it because you've already done it once. And so, you, so, and this is how things go up. And that's essentially Christopher Browning's argument in ordinary men is that what happened is that people did something that was a, that was bad um, and didn't object. And that kind of could keep getting leveraged up into worse and worse behavior. So I think that is that um, if what's at stake is whether you're a good person, then admitting that you made a mistake is that much harder. And so, yeah, you're going to double down. So I, I have, um, and, and maybe people who like to argue get accused of this a lot is that I like, I've been accused of liking to be right. Yes. And, and I, I've recently adopted that. I say, yeah, I do like to be right. I, and in fact, I like to be right better than I like to have thought I was right. Yeah. So I like to be right so much that when I encounter a view that's better, I want to switch so that I can be right. But that that's kind of maybe not a very widely shared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Right. If, if liking to be right, um, it, it matters whether you like to be right or win the argument. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think, yeah, I think that's what people forget, especially if they have a tendency to see the conflicts in an argument as a zero sum. Um, when a really good argument, people, both everybody involved comes out better not necessarily better in terms of the policies, but better in terms of understanding other things, better understanding, I don't know, they just come out better. Oh, I love, I love that. Um, you, you talk on page 33, you have a phrase that I just, I love a lot, um, in part because it's, it's got some alliteration and I'm a poet, um, but you, you talk about how demagoguery helps us escape or promises that we can escape uh, from the responsibilities of rhetoric. And I, re so I really like that phrase. And this, this, uh, this, that word to me, at, at least I'm reading into it, maybe a sense of ethics. Mm -hmm. We have a moral obligation to engage with one another rhetorically. Um, I, I wonder if you might say, say a bit about that. Yeah, I basically got that from Wayne Booth. Um, and from an old and understudied and underappreciated book, um, Modern Dogma and the Rhetoric of Assent. And there he's talking about the situation in the, in the 60s, which was just as bad as what we're in right now. And, um, and to, you know, talking about the difficulties on his campus of people arguing together. And, and the view that's behind that book, and in fact his work generally, is that um, when, you, when you enter into an argument with someone, you enter into a relationship and that there are responsibilities oh. in that relationship. Um, and then also the people, the pragma dialectical folks like Van Emmeren and Grutendurst, they, they talk about a, a similar um, 
I don't think they use the term responsibility, but they get pretty close to it. And that they're, um, I think, I think that they might use the term rules, which I'm not wild about, but basically, you know, you, if you're going to argue responsibly, you're going to represent your opposition accurately. You're going to listen. You're going to give up positions when they, when you can't defend them, you're going to provide evidence. Um, and those are just all responsibilities that we have in talking effectively with one another. I love, I like that. Um, a lot. I mean, it's a, it's a whole, and this is what you're get at in a lot of book. It's a whole different idea of what an argument is. Right? Yeah. It's about it's not about winning. Right. It, it, it shouldn't be right. And if, if we're trapped in an idea that that the point of an argument is to win, mm -hmm. that's that's an ugly place to be. Right. Yeah. And um. Uh. Yeah. And you know there. There are a lot of people who argue that that's actually what Plato was up to in the dialogues as he's trying to show how disastrous it was that Socrates wanted to win arguments and that's why the arguments go so badly. Um, and that he's actually, you know, that Plato is arguing for a different way of thinking about argument. Um, I think that's why Aristotle emphasizes the enthymeme so much, you know, that you've got to have some common ground with somebody. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think there have been lots of people along the way um, I was strongly influenced by Hannah Arendt, and that's very much the argument that that's her vision of public discourse is it's risk taking, um, and uh, but it's 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 not about winning at all costs. I am um, on page uh, forty-five. I think that's where. Uh, yeah, I just felt like so much of my life was explained. And you talk about kind of authoritarianism, and, and I think probably your comment earlier, like just you can have mean forms of democracy that are still democ democratic, right? Mm -hmm. You probably have nice forms of authoritarianism. Yeah, um, probably, yeah. Or su superficially, but, but that you say to not submit is to rebel, declining to participate, asking that we listen to all points of view, wanting time to think through the options, um, trying to discuss flaws in in-group plans and policies. These are all kinds of insubordination, rebellion, and disloyalty. And so that, just that dynamic of you did anything other than follow the party line means you must be against the party line. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and, and I, I came to that by, you know, I mentioned that I, I look at uh, train wrecks and public deliberation. And so I'm really interested in these times that, people people argued a lot they had a lot of arguments and yet they came to really bad decisions and typically got quickly got information that they'd made a bad decision and then recommitted with greater will um, and and you know these were cases where people had the evidence that they needed that they were making a bad decision um, and one of the things that happened is they demonized deliberation so th they that this is what public discourse became is one where you were not allowed to criticize the in group except for inadequate will. That's the only in-group criticism that's allowed, is you can say, we're not committed enough, you know, we've been too weak, we've been too kind to the opposition. But you're not allowed to say, I don't think this, you know, let's talk about the feasibility and solvency and unintended consequences of this policy. Uh, yeah, so. Hmm. Um, I know that, uh, that puppies don't fare too well on your book. <laughs> Actually, I got that example from a friend because um, I wanted to give her a footnote or something, but they they this they, they wouldn't let me do it. But um, I in my classes have this elaborate example. I don't want to use political examples because then students can't hear the principle you're trying to make because they get so caught up in their own feelings yeah. about that political situation. So for a long time, I've had this complicated example about um, whether little dogs are involved or implicated in the conspiracy, the squirrel conspiracy to get the red ball. Um, and so there are two political figures, Chester Burnett and Hubert Sumlin, who are having an argument about that. Um, but it was too complicated for this book to, I, you know, in class, I can explain all the intricacies. And so, but, and so the friend just uses the puppy kicking. So that's, that was what the one I used. So towards, towards the end of your book, you, you mentioned a Greek rhetorician, um, Thucydides. Yeah. Um, 
asked his audience, 124, um, asked his audience uh, to think about how we argue, not just what we argue. Uh, and I'm thinking that's pretty, that's pretty advanced. That's like metacognitive, metacognitive thinking. That's a kind of an advanced form of critical thinking to be able to step back and, and think about that. And I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, does everyone have to learn this for our society to be healthier or, or maybe if it catches on, people just do it without thinking about doing, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. And I, I think that, um, I mean, so the notion of metacognition of just being able to reflect not just what you did, but why it seemed like a good idea at the time and what your thinking process was, right, is something that if you go into couples counseling or if you go into management training or if you go into, if you get a consultant to come in and look at your processes, I mean, in fact, everybody talks about metacognition. This isn't just some sort of weird education thing, um, but um, you know, if, if, if you keep getting into the same, I mean, advice columnists talk about it all the time, if, even if they don't use that term, but you know, if, if, if you keep getting into the same bad kind of relationship and it keeps ending the same tragic way, there's that thing about what's, what's in common, what, you know, what do all those bad relationships have in common? You, well, the way you're thinking about relationships has to change. So, um, so I think actually people being able to engage in metacognition isn't just important for political, but I think it's, it's actually helps people. It's, it's the one way not to repeat mistakes. I think mm. you're pretty much going to have to figure out why, why the mistake you made looked like a good mistake. If you're going to not keep making it. Oh, so, so not just to recognize that it wasn't good, but, but to recognize why it appealed to you. Right. Um, one of one of my favorite passages. I, I guess the book is a little bit of a downer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that maybe that's that's so you don't you don't talk very much directly about the current situation. I guess that's probably the same reason you use puppies in your classroom. Yeah. Because um, anybody would just want to re respond to that instead of the ideas. But I'm bringing the current context to the text. And I'm, and I'm discouraged, um, but but I, I loved and was encouraged by uh, on 99. I mean, you're you're listing some things that we can do. What what do we do? Is the chapter, um, and one is that there's there are other forms of persuasion than argument. Mm -hmm. And so you you say on 99, demagoguery about them is undone by empathy. Um, uh, generalizations about them are complicated and sometimes shattered by experiences with individual members of them or even humanizing stories. So tell those stories um, and then a little layer, on, uh, little lower on the page, you say, bear witness to the glory of diversity in pluralism. And that just struck me as a profoundly hopeful and practical, and, and I just, I liked it. <laughs> Um, in classes, I'll often ask students, what's the time that you were persuaded to change your mind on some big issue? And one of the things I want them to realize is it's pretty rare that you pick up an article and suddenly, you know, completely flip. Um, sometimes on relatively specific points you might, um, but for the most part, persuasion happens slowly over, a, on big issues, happens slowly over a long period of time. And there might be the one moment finally when you're like, oh, that was it. Okay, I'm done now. Um, but um, but what I also noticed was students often talked about stories as having persuaded them, um, and uh, family stories or um, narratives, fiction, you know, all sorts of um, all sorts of things. And there's there's you know some research out there on. Um, essentially the, the neuropsychology of empathy and the importance of narratives for those. It's also true that a lot of times when you talk, again, talk to people who really change their minds on big things, it's that they had, they always believed that, you know, that group behaved a certain way. And then often it's, I mean, this is one of the things that college can do. They go to college and they sit next to someone in class who's a member of that group and they discover they're okay. 
Um, and so it's, you know, that's so well documented that a lot of people are very concerned about the whole bowling alone phenomenon, you know, about the fact that, that we're in a culture where people don't necessarily um, meet or interact a lot with people who are very different from them. If you're in a bowling league, granted it's somebody in your neighborhood, but they might be a different religion, they might be different politics, they might be, you know, different ethnicity. Um, but if, if you're in this completely self-selected world of your Facebook or your Instagram, you can pick people who are exactly like you. So, so that's, that's the less hopeful part of the, of the narrative is, are, are we hearing those? But yeah, I think a lot of times just, just knowing somebody different. You talk about, I think maybe one of the core themes running through the book is the concept of fairness. Mm -hmm. more than niceness, right? That, mm -hmm. that you can be a jerk so long as they can be a jerk. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no whining. I, 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 seems like I'm, I might have had a sense um, growing up that kind of belittle fairness as a, as a value, like life's not fair, you know, uh, suck it up, buttercup. Um, so how but that's, yeah, and that's a response to one way that people use fair. And so this is sort of um, uh, fairness as people getting what they want, or fairness as um, people getting what they think they deserve versus fairness as treatment of all parties as equal. And yeah, you know, I think it's useful for people to know you're not always going to get everything you think you deserve. Um, you aren't entitled to everything that you feel you're entitled to. And right now we, we've got a culture where that discourse is actually dominant, where there's a whole lot of discussion of, um, of entitlement. Um, and, and, you know, there's the, the research on some pretty nasty stuff suggests that people are more likely to respond violently to a threat to their status than they are to any other kind of threat. And they experience threat to status as a um, as an existential threat that they are going to be destroyed and their group will be destroyed. So, uh, for them to for something to be fair means that they get they're entitled to get more. Um, and so, with them, it's hard. I think that's why it's really important to try to say no. That's not so. Fairness means whatever processes we have apply equally. You aren't entitled to different processes. And I, and I think that that ties into the like if the goal is to win well i want but i want it to be unfair in my favor right so we we have to be i guess committed committed to something bigger than than short-term winning yeah yeah I, and so this is another place where sports is really interesting because um in-group favoritism is just one of the base cognitive biases and people have done some funny research about how you notice the bad calls against your team much more than you notice bad calls against the other team. Ah. Even just in terms of numbers, you know, and um, because the bad calls against the other team just don't even register or you don't think about whether they're bad or not. Um, and so, right. And so that's one where um, to, to be fair, you actually have to think carefully about would I have objected to that call if I were on the other side? And, um, yeah, and so so fairness also involves perspective shifting. Because we're not good judges of what's fair and what isn't. And and how could we sell someone on that? Like how 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 could somebody be convinced that fairness is in their best interest long term, even though it might cost them right now? Yeah. Um to some extent, you know, it's it's the world. So the argument that some philosophers have made is it's the world you want to live in, ultimately. Um, you know, and and but I, I do find that really really hard to argue with people about because um, what they'll say is, you know, I'm I'm winning and I deserve to win and that's all I care about. But um, what goes around comes around, <laughs> you know, and and um, what that's why I think people like um, Martin Niemöller or um, Franz von Galen, you know, those people are really important for, these are people who supported Hitler um, and liked his fascism, liked his authoritarianism, liked that he violated the law, liked that he recreated the law to be him. Um, they liked his conservative political agenda. They liked the outcomes that they were getting until suddenly they didn't like the outcomes. And that was the moment when they realized that the process had been bad all along. 
and they should have objected to the process long before it hurt them. Um, because ultimately a process that is an authoritarian process is going to hurt. You don't know who it's going to hurt. You know, it's, it's a spinning, it's a kind of spinning cannon that's just going to knock somebody. It's going to let loose at some point. Um, so that's, that's, I think one way, I think it's really interesting that that's a constant in the major ethical systems. Um, you know, going as far back as, I mean, that's, that's the argument that keeps getting made in, in platonic dialogues, right? Is, uh, would you rather suffer injustice or, um, uh, but have done the right thing, you know, and it's, and that's the argument that Socrates makes in the, um, uh, in the Credo and the, and Apologia, but especially in the Credo, um, it's, you know, do unto others. Um, it's yeah. So I think, um, so I think that's that's the other route that one can go is that's your that's the ethical system we claim to have. I, I'm I'm disheartened by how ineffective a, a, an argument is the right thing to do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It seems to be. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be almost almost that laughable if someone would would su suggest, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't do X because it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, but um, That's heartbreaking. think how important it is to some people to say, to claim the moral high ground in politics and to say we're the better party because what we're doing is right. Well, that's then doing this thing that's wrong is, a, is something to be argued about and something we need to consider because that's violating your claims about who you are. That's the only way I know to do it. I have, I have a couple more questions. Um, do, do you have anything you want to ask me as a reader of your book? Um, I guess, um, so I think that if I were going to do it again, I would put in more stories. Okay. Um, and I just, I, so I guess one thing I would wonder is, is, was it too abstract? You know, would it, would stories help? Huh. So I, I did think the stories that you use, particularly the case, the case study on. On Warren. Yeah. Warren who I just really like that, that he later regretted what he had done. And so that, I think that story is very, um, very effective in it. I, yeah, I, I, I could never say no to more stories. <laughs> um, but I did, I did think that the, the examples you gave were really useful, including that they were at least decades removed from us. Yeah. And on issues that, well, I guess, I guess not everyone all of a sudden agrees that the Japanese internment was wrong anymore. Yeah. Um, but on, on issues that are generally agreed, that was a mistake. Yeah. I find that really helpful. Um, I think again, it's easier for people to process. So I, I have a class that's about just how people deliberate about going to war and it is, um, about a half of it is on the Peloponnesian War. Uh, oh. And because, yeah, nobody's going to get like, oh, those Spartans, you know. Um, <laughs> how can you say that about them, you know? So, <laughs> uh, so I, I feel like, you know, that students can learn, can learn the methods of analysis and then we can move to, to closer ones that are a little bit more controversial. Um, but it's, you know, by the time those come up, ideally people understand we're talking about processes and not identities. Um, I'm looking at my notes here because I, I I have more than two notes, but I said I would ask a couple more. <laughs> um, so you you one of the examples that you gave stories that you gave that was um, very useful was the deliberation about abolitionism kind of mm -hmm. leading up to the civil war and you talk about how the south and, and slaveholders and supporters of slavery in general uh you use the phrase rapidly factionalized media uh, and so it's not just that they were getting incorrect information about the abolitionists they, they they basically had no no way to know what abolitionists actually thought right uh, and so they they had their media had given them, I mean, they're just cut off from reality. And so they, they couldn't have actually, they might have still disagreed, but they, they weren't actually disagreeing with the abolitionists. They were disagreeing with some invention. 
yeah. That, that sounds, uh, I mean, kind of scary, right? That you could kind of like Truman Show where you can yeah. cut off from re reality. You're living some. I, yeah, and, and, it, and it's, it's funny because some of that stuff even ends up in the history. So famously, um, uh, all the newspapers reported a, a riot, uh, a race riot at, that ended with lynchings in, um, over abolitionists in um, a particular place and actually with some gamblers um but but you can still see history books that will refer to that by the way it was reported um the other one is the 1835 uh mailing of pamphlets that didn't actually happen and you can see history books that talk about that so it's yeah it, it can continue but it's it um it's very difficult if you've heard something repeated over and over and over and you've repeated by people you trust it's very difficult to unlearn that and that's what like Kathleen Hall Jameson discovered when she was trying to debunk ads. I don't know if you've read anything that she's written about that, but she found that she was showing people these ads that were false and then she debunked them. And then afterwards they remembered the bad version because they'd heard it twice. Uh. Um, so yeah, so debunking is e even is sort of problematic, but it's just because we are so, we're so likely to confuse frequency of hearing information with validity of information. Um, that's um that's unsettling yeah and i mean you know and we and we all do it and and um i discovered at one point i can't remember if i mentioned this in the i think it was in one version of the book but i don't know if it ended up in the final version but i um i suddenly realized at one point that i had very strong opinions about expert witnesses and trials and i thought why would i have strong opinions about that since i've never read any studies on it i've you know, I have friends who've, who are attorneys, but they've never talked about that. So where did this come from? And I realized it came from law and order. Uh. <laughs> you know? And the fact that expert witnesses for the defense are always douchebags and they're terrible people and they're dishonest and they're corrupt and stuff. And I went, oh, OK, that's where I have that. But that was just a narrative I'd heard so much that it had managed to, to creep into my um, view about, you know, about something that. And it's just a plot point. It just makes it easier for them to do certain things uh, in, you know, in a TV show. But yeah, and I'm sure there are tons of other things that are like that that I don't know about because there has never been a reason for me to think, well, wait, why, where, where is that from? One of the, one of the last things you say in the book, um, I think is probably my favorite statement um, on 127. You say good disagreements are the bedrock of communities, mm -hmm. and I, I like I like I like a lot about it. I just it's a really well written sentence. It's a it's got that aphoristic quality to it. Um, it. It promotes disagreements and and distinguishes between good and bad ones, or or healthy or unhealthy or productive and unproductive, and then I think it reinforces this this notion that runs through the whole book that we are we're a community here we're not two separate communities at war we're a we're a community and we we ought to these this is things are, are not going to get better if, unless we start acting like that yeah so, so i just i love that so that's that um that statement yeah ultimately um we you know, ultimately, I think that um, a really good political community has people with very different political positions um, arguing in it. And I think it needs people who argue for a small government and low taxes, and it needs people who will argue for a you know heavy social safety net and people who will argue for environmental protection. I mean, it's just it you need all those sorts of arguments. Um, and uh, and then the, the solution that we come to will always make everybody a little bit unhappy. <laughs> um, and some people will get a little bit more in this one and ideally get a little bit less, you know, in others. But, um, but I really think that we make better decisions if we take into consideration those various perspectives. Awesome. Uh, I've just really enjoyed this. Is there, is there anything else that you'd like to say? No, just this is really fun. As I said, it's really fun to talk to somebody who's actually read the book. And, you know, it's it. I, so I was I was working on the book on pro-slavery rhetoric um, in the early 2000s. And I was so depressed by um, how much 
I felt like we were headed in the same direction of these really factionalized groups that people living in these little informational enclaves. And, um, and so, yeah. And so this, you know, I just, I really, really wanted to write this and something like this. So it's been really fun. Am, am I, am I right in remembering that you have coming out a, a longer kind yeah. of active version of this? Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to come out in March. Um, and it's, yeah, it's with Southern Illinois University Press and, and it's the more scholarly and it's, so there's a much longer discussion of the Japanese internment uh, trial um, or testimony, you know, committee hearings. Um, yeah. Chapter on segregation, chapter on uh, Cleon. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's much more the sort of standard. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for you doing this work and thanks so much. Well, thanks for this. It's really fun. All right. Okay.